Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Uh, so this is about relationships uh, in the material world. Uh, we have uh, relationships everywhere. Huh? So as far as material bodies are concerned, uh, we can say that relationships are natural. Uh, like uh, so many animals have different instincts, so the idea of having relationships is also uh, something very natural. Uh, we see it all over the animal kingdom, uh, and particularly in the higher animals who find this uh, tendency to group together. Uh, it's a very, very strong tendency. Uh, and, of course, among human beings we find this is also so. And we actually find that now in the present day. People are stuck in their houses and they're all alone. <laughs> they want to associate with other people <laughs> and they have to keep social distance and they've got to keep apart from them. <laughs> and they find it very frustrating because they want to be close to people. Huh? And some places, I just saw today in the news that legally they couldn't close the uh, pubs in Wisconsin, America. So the court orders, you have to open the pubs, so immediately they, they announced we're going to open the pubs in 45 minutes, and then right when they open them, they're all full of people. And they forgot about wearing masks or being distanced from each other, all crowded in all the different pubs there. <laughs> and they're all having a good time <laughs> drinking and talking and eating together. Uh, so in spite of the dangers in that, they ignore that because uh, they're, they're social animals. <laughs> they want to congregate together and that instinct is very, very strong. So it's not only in the animals but in the human beings also. Uh, however, human beings have much more complex relationships than animals. Uh, the, the relationships between animals are quite simple. Uh, uh, usually it's parental relationships. We see the mother raises the young animals often, takes care of them and they grow up and then they go away from home. Or sometimes they get into a bigger group and they go around in uh, flocks or whatever, or herds or whatever like that together. Uh, and they have some sort of order, they get a, a, a someone in charge and they get the other ones following. But basically they're there to protect them, that whole community. They protect their group by that method of uh, coming together. Uh, but the, the relationships are re relatively simple. Uh, when we come to human beings, uh, it's, it's, it, we can say it's related. One is a reflection of the other. Uh, the human beings' relationships are a reflection of the animal relationships, but it becomes much more complex. And the reason for that is that the human mind has uh, higher development. And uh, of course one of the uses of that mind is to think of spiritual things, to not think of the body at all. But the, uh, because the mind is quite complex and developed, uh, it stores a lot of information and um, this creates a lot of problems for the human being. Uh, and it results in very complex relationships, not simple relationships. Of course, if we look at the original relationships in the spiritual world, in one sense, they're quite simple. They do have complexities, because otherwise it would be very boring. So it's that complexity of the relationship in the spiritual world which creates rasa. In the material world, it also creates rasa, but the rasa is not very pleasant. <laughs> Often it's quite disastrous in the material world. Uh, so. Uh, we have uh, a lot of problems because of that. Um, oh, and another reason is um, probably that's why people like to have dogs, <laughs> pet dogs, <laughs> because the relationship is quite simple. The dog's relationship with the human being is very simple. Uh, uh, they, they're not hung up and they don't get mental about anything. So therefore, uh, it's easier to have a relationship with a dog than it is to have a relationship with another human being. <laughs> But it's not completely satisfying either, because they're, they're different species, so there's a problem there also. Anyway, we have these complex uh, relationships in the human being, because we do have a more 
highly developed mind, etc. Uh, in the material world, if we analyze it from the spiritual point of view, we have the jiva or the atma, who is the center of consciousness. But his desire is to get some happiness here for himself. If the jiva did not have that desire, he would not be in the material world. <laughs> Because we want to get some happiness for ourselves uh, without recognition of the Supreme Lord, therefore we try to establish relationships as a means of happiness. It's not the only way we can get happiness, but it is uh, one of those means and it becomes one of the uh, important means for the human being. We can develop a relationship with things. The whole idea is that uh, it's a little bit artificial because the Atma is there, but it's very different from matter. So how does the Jiva relate to matter? So we have two things. We've got a subtle body and a gross body. And the gross body, of course, is, can interact with matter, no problem. Subtle body is intermediary between the gross body and the soul. Uh, so, within the subtle body, we get the mind, intelligence, and false ego. So, they take the consciousness of the jiva and transform that in such a way that it looks like the mind, intelligence, and ego are operating separately from the atma, and they cooperate with the senses, and then the senses try to enjoy the material world. Uh, so, our senses go out and try to establish some sort of relationships with things. Uh, we see in the analysis of matter that we have a sense, like the eye, and then we have a tanmatra, which is called the sense object or the vishaya. So each particular sense has an object of that it gets attached to, and it's through that object that the uh, person gets enjoyment. So it is uh, a contact of matter with matter, material sense with sense object, which is also material, and then we get happiness. Of course, well, how can the Atma get happiness from this chemical interaction, so to speak, <laughs> of matter with matter? They actually cannot. <laughs> so the only way the Jiva can do that is when it, uh, it identifies with the body and the senses and the mind by Ahankara. And then it thinks it's, I'm the mind or I'm the body, and then it can and get some enjoyment out of these things. Yeah. Uh, so anyway, the senses automatically go out to touch the sense object and establish some sort of relationship there. Yeah. So we can get relationships with objects. And this is very common in the world. People get obsessed with different things. Yeah. And uh, uh, for instance, the tongue. Uh, the tongue is for tasting. So the tongue is a sense organ. When the sense object is taste. And so that taste uh, resides in various objects of this world. And therefore we try to taste those objects, to get those objects and taste them. <laughs> Acquire them and taste them. Right? Uh, so this is so for all the senses. We have objects for the eye, objects for the ear, etc. And uh, we can endeavor to satisfy all of our senses in this way. Uh, so that is, we can say, relationship with things, objects of this world, which have particular sense objects which give us happiness. This, of course, is also relative. For instance, the pig has a different sense, happiness of sense objects than the human being. Or some human beings have different sense object happiness than others. So the people are criticizing the people of Wuhan, how you can eat those objects in the market. <laughs> but then what are the people of Australia doing? They're eating the objects of, <laughs> of the butcher shop or whatever also. <laughs> so uh, different people have different food habits and uh, what is delicious to one is not delicious to the other. <laughs> and everybody has his individual taste as well. So uh, it's all relative. What is the happiness from taste or from eye or for ear, whatever, it's relative to the person. Uh, nevertheless, uh, we try to get some 
happiness from this. Huh? And now we can see it's of course relative. Huh? Uh, some of the um, enjoyment's a little bit abstract because people get attached to money. But what is money? It's not a sense object that you can enjoy. <laughs> but it's because you can get things to uh, get your sense enjoyment with. Therefore, people get attached to money also. And they uh, have a relationship with the possessiveness of their money also. Uh, so this is a, like an indirect type of attachment, but uh, something to do with the human mind. He can become attached to things that have no meaning at all and in themselves they don't give any sense gratification. <laughs> so, we can all get our happiness from different sense objects and people do that. But usually, uh, the goal of people or the, the goal of happiness, what they, how want, they want to get their happiness is from a relationship with another human being. So that becomes, uh, everyone thinks, that that's the ultimate happiness. To establish a relationship with another human being. Yeah? Uh, they may have the other relationships, but usually um, we have to balance that out with a relationship with a person. Uh, and therefore we'll find that in human society there's a lot of arrangements for uh, association of people. Of course, the common one is the family unit, husband, wife, and children. Yeah. Uh, so these are all uh, relationships, relationship between husband and wife, relationship of the parents with the children. Uh, so that's one very strong uh, relationship uh, in this material world, the family unit. A uh, very, very strong motive for people. Uh, uh, and of course, it's encouraged in most societies, have a happy family, is the idea. Huh? Uh, so everybody strives for that. And that happy family means husband, wife, and children. So it's a common goal around the world. And we'll see that as emphasized in the uh, Vedas as well. They have a, a marriage ceremony, so it's a samskar. Uh, so it's an elaborate ceremony to uh, sanctify a marriage yeah. and the whole um, ceremony is there to give blessings of happiness you should be happy together uh, and you should have ten children <laughs> that's the blessing have ten children <laughs> live a long life have ten children uh, etc be happy so it's, it's a, the encouragement of uh, family life uh, Apart from that, of course, then we have other relationships. We have friendship relationships, etc. All sorts of relationships. We have relationships with groups, uh, bigger family groups. And then we have uh, community relationships. And then, of course, we get country relationships, which are a little more artificial, but nevertheless, those are also there. We get class relationships. <laughs> In India, Brahmins are one group, Vaishyas are another group, Kshatriyas are another group, Sudras are another group, and they identify with their group. And in other countries they have that, or they did have it in ancient society, probably in continues now, they have the high class aristocratic group and the merchant groups and things like this, huh? or the intelligentsia group. Huh? Uh, so in any case, the people are interacting and they get some satisfaction from the relationships within these different uh, groups. Huh? Uh, so the idea is happiness. And uh, though we get the happiness from these things, even if you have these things, you long for the happiness of the relationship. So this becomes very, very prominent. Unfortunately, there's a problem, just like there's a problem with the, uh, <laughs> the food and everything else here, the, you just, you know, the, the objects. Whether it's the objects or whether it's the humans, the problem is, that it's not real, <laughs> in the sense that it's not what we think it is. So the, as I said, the, let's say the food is all relative. What, what is good food is relative to country, is relative to individual, etc. Uh, relative to the species. Uh, the dog eats different food from the pig, it, it, it eats different food from the human being. 
Yeah? And people in different countries have it say this is delicious, others say it's not delicious. So it's all relative. So uh, there's no real standard. It's all because we project things into objects. And so the same thing happens with the relationships. We project what is supposed to be enjoyable on another person. <laughs> There's, and it's got, it becomes disastrous in some cases because of that. Uh, in, the, in, in, uh, in terms of material objects, it's not so disastrous because you can take it, experience, I don't like that, and you can just discard it. But with relationships, it's a little more difficult. You can't just keep discarding the relationships without causing big problems. <laughs> but nevertheless, we've got a, a complex mechanism at work here uh, in which, uh, which becomes more complex when uh, the people have um, problems, mental problems, we can say. <laughs> uh, so uh, one is, the, is we, we develop a set of beliefs uh, based upon our experiences of previous lifetime and in our childhood. And often that belief is uh, we have a bad image of ourselves. Okay? I'm not what I should be, I'm no good. And then we have a contrary image, I should be like this. So we have a negative image, I'm that bad thing, and I should be like this. And we have an ideal image. Yeah? And then we project that onto, uh, or we, we identify it, with that image and we become a, a victim of things uh, you know I just have to suffer in this world and uh, we give up and we, we fail and then we have the, the, the other side with the artificial but it's positive but it's artificially positive the opposite of the no good I, I, this is the ideal image and we associate that with success in life and so we project these images uh, onto others as well in order to satisfy ourselves, So this becomes a big problem. Huh? Uh, and because the human being is not just a body, he's also a subtle body. Mm. The, uh, we're not aware of the interaction between the gross body and the subtle body and between two gross bodies interacting and two subtle bodies interacting. It's a very complex thing. So uh, because of all these uh, concepts of images, etc., uh, the relationships get very mixed up, especially on the subtle level. Uh, uh, so the subtle body is a, it's a body, but it's very flexible because it's subtle material. So according to your emotions, that body keeps changing into all sorts of shapes. <laughs> and it can mold itself into different forms, etc. And it can project itself onto other people. Uh, so here we just see the examples of the different forms that that subtle body takes. And, uh, different circumstances. So anyway, we have our uh, false image of who we are, the negative image, and then the ideal positive image. Uh, uh, so uh, these are not real. They're just ideas in our head. But they uh, mold our vision of what is the world. We see everything in terms of the what we think we are. <laughs> and just like if you wear uh, colored glasses and the whole world looks that color. Hmm? So if you, if you think you're this negative person like that, then you see the whole world in terms of that. Or you see it in the opposite by projecting the positive image. Hmm? Uh, so uh, this, of course, creates a lot of problems for trying to get happiness because we're projecting these images of what is uh, what you should be and what you're not or whatever it's like that, all of which is completely false. <laughs> like that. Huh? Uh, so, um, from the Vedic analysis we understand the whole world is Maya. Not that it's completely false, but when we see things in this world or experience things, it's, it's actually a false experience. Which means that what we think is nice experience or is good is not actually good. <laughs> As I said, it's relatively good. And each uh, person uh, has a different experience. But yet we think this is, this is, this is what is real. 
Uh, but it's just that the image that we have that's projected onto everything in this world. Uh, so even it's in terms of negativity or positivity, and we project that outward. So that projection takes place, and it gets uh, projected onto people. Uh, so in, instead of seeing the person as they are, we project the images that we have, either the negative image or the positive image, onto the other person because we're trying to get happiness out of a relationship. <laughs> so we'll project all the positive ideal images onto that other person, even if they don't exist. <laughs> and we think, this is, this is a good person. I'll get happiness from this relationship. Uh, so we get expectations from our relationships. Uh, but it's not based upon reality, it's based upon projection of false images. Uh, so, that can only lead to failure, ultimately. Hmm. So, because it's all based upon our expectations, and uh, we cannot predict how other people are going to respond, and we can't predict the circumstances that are going to happen, like for now, <laughs> the circumstances everybody's locked in their houses, we can't predict all these uh, what's going to happen. We can't predict what, how the other person is going to react uh, when we do something or say something. Uh, we end up with a very unstable uh, mind. Uh, uh, things do not work out according to what we predict or what we expect. So we may end up full of depression and failure and anger, etc., when things don't work out. But the reason they don't work out is because the expectation itself is false. We're projecting the expectation on something which isn't there. <laughs> so, sooner or later, the, uh, the reality will show through. So, uh, in this way. Uh, uh, we uh, not only project it outward, but the subtle body of the living entity also gets completely transformed or distorted by the, all these negative feelings and artificial feelings that take place within us. Huh? So it's a, it's a complex, artificial thought pattern we have, but it, it's also physical in the sense it's the subtle body. So the subtle body, instead of operating nicely, it becomes clouded over and clogged up and cloudy and dark and whatever. And um, it, it, uh, the subtle body is there and it stays with us all the time. So we can't escape it. <laughs> we can't escape that, that negative influence uh, uh, that we've got. It, it stays with us. So often, um, because of the, situ the situation at the present is similar to a past situation, then we will react in the same way as we did in the past. Huh? It's not what is actually uh, real, but it's just what we assume is real. Uh, so we react to something because it's got some similarity to a past event or a past person. Uh, and for others, it may look like a, an unreasonable response. <laughs> we may get angry at something, and, and, uh, but, and for us it's justified. But actually for everybody else, it doesn't have any meaning. Why is he getting angry like this? So it's because we're associating that with some past experience and so we're projecting that onto the other person or the other circumstance. Uh, so, uh, therefore, some of the uh, responses we have may be very inappropriate at the, proper t at the present time uh, because they're related to something in the past that's no longer there, but we project that into the present. Uh, so we end up in relationships with people uh, because it is, is a, it, in a very, it's very complicated because each person is projecting. <laughs> We're projecting expectations on other people and they're also projecting things on us. And neither of them knows the mind of the other person and what they're projecting. So everybody's getting false expectations from the other person. Uh, or they, they think this person's like that, the other person that person is like that. So, we, we, we're living in a world where we establish relationships and what we think the person is actually isn't the person, it's something else. <laughs> it's a, a false Maya person that we're thinking of. 
And then we establish a relationship based on that. <laughs> Two people establish a relationship uh, uh, thinking the person's like this and that person's like that. So that's all Maya. It's complete Maya. How, how, how can we uh, have a true relationship when, when we have such a relationship? Not possible. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, this is just an expansion of that. We, we get all these sorts of uh, problems as a result. Um, uh, okay, just go on then. So, as I said, it's all based upon uh, Maya. And ultimately, um, we have that false ego there. Uh, even if we can have a, uh, we're not so mental and we don't have so many emotional problems, still we're stuck with a, a false identity because we're identifying with a body in this world and we're still trying to get enjoyment. So therefore, whatever we do is still covered by that maya and our attempts to get that enjoyment is going to fail. But uh, when we get to the, the person who's uh, uh, got all these complexes and uh, is projecting positive uh, images and negative images on other people, then the uh, relationships become impossible. <laughs> so if people are normal people, then they can carry on. It's not a perfect relationship, but they can adjust. But where we have uh, persons who have this abnormal tendency, well, then the relationships are pretty hopeless and it becomes very difficult to have any relationship at all. But in any case, it's all Maya, and therefore, there can be no real uh, harmony at all. So, as I said, um, we're attempting to have relationships, just as animals have relationships. Everyone is social. Uh, so, we have all sorts of relationships, but very, very difficult to find satisfaction in these things. <laughs> uh, so, we end up with all sorts of emotional problems taking place between people because of the misidentification, etc. So, in other words, we're living in a rather false world, huh? which is kind of exemplified now by the fact that we can use machines to make a false world, and we think we're living in that world. You put the little glasses on, and you're, you think there's a ghost in front of you, you think there's a monster in front of you like this, and uh, whatever. So, the whole world, in one sense, is like that for everybody. That's why it's called Maya. Huh? So, it's not just the people that have a few emotional problems, but everybody is living in that Maya world, and everything is to some extent false. It's not that the objects are false, but are what we think they are is false. Mm -hmm. And that goes even for science. <laughs> so science has developed a whole paradigm of uh, what is reality, based upon, you know, molecules and electrons and whatever like this, and then small objects, big objects, and then universe and solar system and galaxies, etc. Mm -hmm. It's a, it's a concept yeah, of, of looking at matter. But it's limited because of our false ego, our senses, our mind, etc. So it's not the ultimate reality by any means. It's, we can say, a little bit closer uh, to being objective than our subjective feelings for people. But nevertheless, still, we can't say it's absolutely true. Yeah. So that's why when uh, uh, we discuss modern science, we shouldn't put complete faith in it, that it's, abs it's absolute. No, it's relative. It's all part of Maya. So, as I said, in any case, all of this is very foreign to the Atma or the Jiva. The Jiva is completely separate from all of this Maya that's going on, where we've got the false ego and the subtle body and the gross body and trying to establish relationships and uh, getting happiness out of this material world is completely different from the Atma. Everything actually is achit, completely dull, no consciousness. And the jiva has consciousness. So there's no way in which the jiva can get satisfaction from a dead object. Yeah? It's like water and fire how they can coexist together. Hmm? Uh, so how can the jiva coexist with matter? Uh, uh, it cannot be, it can, it can be there, but it cannot be happy. There is, the, the objects cannot experience happiness. Matter cannot experience happiness. It's insentient, unconscious. 
the jiva is conscious, it can experience happiness. So how, by relating to matter, we can get happiness? Because <laughs> this, this cannot experience happiness at all. But we can do that by this false projection through ahankara, okay? where we identify with the subtle body and the gross body. Then we can think we're getting happiness. Okay? But it's all illusion, and it's very unnatural for the soul. So no matter what we do in this world, we may get suffering, in which case we conclude the world is not a nice place to live. We may get happiness, and then we'll think, oh, the world is very nice, but still, we're not happy. So if we take the richest people in the world, are they any happier than the other people? No. In fact, they're more miserable in many cases. <laughs> so that's because uh, material things cannot really satisfy us, ultimately. And even if we got an ideal situation where we are uh, level-headed, etc., we're not projecting extremely on other people, still very, very difficult to get that happiness. Yeah? But it's also the nature of the soul to get that happiness. <laughs> yeah? But in the material world, we end up in the opposite situation. We strive for the happiness, cannot get it. So, we end up full of stress. <laughs> Uh, which affects the body, affects our behavior, and causes our emotions to be irregular. Uh, yeah. So, uh, we can escape from physical and emotional pain. Uh, we can isolate ourselves from the causes. Uh, how do we do that? Get rid of that negative viewpoint or whatever, stop all the images that we're projecting, stop all the uh, false beliefs that we have. This, so this is what uh, psychologists do, or psychiatrists try to do. Try to get rid of all of these false images that you have. It's also often a very difficult process and it doesn't quite work <laughs> but they, they know what the problem is but how to solve it is, is, is not it's very difficult huh? so but nevertheless uh, we should try to do that somehow we have to stop that mind from functioning in the way it does one process is the yoga process uh, this whole goal is to stop the mental functions completely and when it can do that you get samadhi and that means atma, realization takes place, so realization of the body. But as we see, that's also a very difficult process. It can be done, but it's very difficult to do. Mm -hmm. Still, uh, and we can't get rid of this problem unless we do something with the mind and stop this whole uh, process. So, yoga can do it, but very, very difficult for us. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, the other way is higher taste. Uh, the embodied soul may be restricted from sense enjoyment, although the taste for sense objects remains. But ceasing such engagements by experience a higher taste, he is fixed in consciousness. So, the lower taste is uh, the taste we get from material objects. The higher taste is the taste from the Atma. The taste we're getting from the material objects is there. Of course we could say it's related to the Atma, uh, but it's directed towards objects of this world. Uh, so the object uh, is, uh, the Atma is flowing outwards through the senses trying to get happiness from material objects, which is impossible because it's completely unlike the objects. <laughs> uh, so the idea is to reverse that. Uh, and not to give up uh, even the sense uh, objects or the sense uh, perceptions or the workings of the senses or the mind, but rather direct it inward to get the higher taste. Hmm? Okay, so instead of going outwards, we have to go inward somehow or other. 
So that's where we talk about self-realization, whatever, God-realization, or that what we, in the modern world, they don't want to use words like that, they call spirituality or whatever like that. So this is an attempt to uh, get out of the, exter uh, the flow, external flow of our senses outward with the Atma, trying to get enjoyment here, and go inward and work on the Atma itself. Okay, so what is that higher taste? Uh, one, of course, is the taste of the Atman being itself, not the body or the senses or relating to sense objects. So that's satisfaction of the self. So that's what we call uh, Atmarama, which is impersonalism, but at least you're satisfied with the self, not the external objects. Uh, but then the other higher taste is relating to Supreme Lord. So that relationship we call rasa. That means taste. <laughs> so that verse was about taste here. I get a higher taste. So uh, from uh, our Vaishnava point of view, we say the taste that you get from realizing Brahman is actually not taste. <laughs> because in that Brahman realization, there is no taster. And there's no object taste. There's only oneness. So taste requires a person to taste and an object of taste. So there's no taste there in the Brahman realization. And if we have the taste in the material world, it is that false taste because of identification with the false ego and then experiencing objects of this world. And that doesn't work either because the objects are not like the Atma at all. So the real way of getting the taste is to relate the Atma to the Supreme Atma. They're very similar. We've got two spiritual entities, the Jiva and the Supreme Lord. Make a relationship there. So we have the Jiva experiencing, and what is he experiencing? He has a taste for the Supreme Lord. Hmm? So that relationship we call Rasa. Hmm? So just as we try to establish material relationships and get happiness there, there's, that's what we call material Rasa. <laughs> The body is all, you know, it's the Atma, and then we have the material aspect, and it doesn't, it doesn't fit together. So the real rasa, the real relationship, is the spiritual relationship between the Atma and the Supreme Lord. So that's where we get the higher taste, that's where we get real satisfaction. So the, all these other attempts produce uh, blockages in our aura and create problems, but if we connect to the Supreme Lord, then everything gets straightened out. Everything becomes harmonious. Subtle body, gross body, relationship with the Supreme Lord. Huh? Because the Atma is satisfied, everything else works out. So we solve all the problems, materially and spiritually, by that relationship with the Supreme Lord. Hmm. This is a little bit... Um, <laughs> based on this. See there's different layers here of your subtle body. And the one around the body itself then there's a little bigger circle there, a little bigger circle there, a little bigger circle like that. So these are the layers of your subtle body which are not two-dimensional but actually three-dimensional like that or maybe more dimensional but we can say at least three-dimensional they expand around you and they interpenetrate with each other also <laughs> like bodies. Um, so, and each of those bodies has particular functions, starting from the grossest function to the most subtle function. And so there's a progression from one part of the subtle body to the next in different layers. Huh? So as we uh, develop our connection with Krishna, then all of these things get straightened out, one after the other. Huh? Huh? So the lowest one, of course, is the physical body there in the center. The next is uh, a little mental self-acceptance. The next is a little more intellectual understanding the situation around us. Next is harmonious relationships, which has to do with the heart chakra also. Uh, and fifth is developing a higher purpose in life. Uh, next is uh, expression of bhakti. And then is a connection with the Supreme Lord in connection with everything. So as we go to the higher and higher layers, we get more ex expansive consciousness. and. Uh, we get higher bliss also. So therefore the connection with the Supreme Lord solves all the problems that we have in relation to everything, ourself, our body, society, 
and uh, Supreme Lord. Amen. So we, do, we become connected with everything huh, in this way. Okay, so the process of doing that is uh, that how do we develop that higher taste? Uh, we have to connect with the uh, Supreme Lord. So what is the process? It is the Bhakti Yoga. So in that process, we do not stop the senses and uh, the mind, though they are material and they're subject to maya. Rather, we engage the senses and the mind. So, um, of course, people may criticize, how can you uh, get something spiritual by using material things? Uh, but this is the, the nature of bhakti. Uh, by the Lord's mercy, we can engage material things and we get a spiritual result. So by performing bhakti yoga, establishing a relationship with the Lord, we can utilize our senses and our mind. So in this process, what we are doing is establishing a relationship. That's what bhakti is. We're establishing a loving relationship which gives rise to bliss. But it is free of all those false identities that we have in the material world. So that we're striving for happiness through relationships in the material world, the real way we can establish happiness is by relationship with Krishna. Yeah, so, and we, to do that, we practice by uh, using the material senses in the mind, and we direct that towards Krishna. Yeah? And then they don't have any negative effect, those uh, material instruments. Hmm? Okay, so uh, in this process, we, dis we realize the Atma, or discover who the Self is, that's our Self, and we discover Supreme Lord and our relationship with the Supreme Lord. Yeah? And by that relationship, then we get connected with everything else. Hmm. So the Rasa uh, is there with the Supreme Lord, but in our sampradaya, we emphasize the rasa with Krishna. And why is that? Uh, and the reason is, if we establish the rasa with other forms of the Lord, we do not get variety in the rasa. The most we can get is shanta rasa or dasya rasa, with Vishnu and Rai and uh, Ramchandra or others. If we want to get variegated rasas, like Sakya, Vatsaya, and Madhurya, then we have to establish a relationship with Krishna. So that, we say, is the difference between Krishna and the other forms of the Lord. Uh, it's not because he's better or above and both there below, but because we can establish more relationships. Why? Because he has manifestation of more qualities. So therefore, we can establish those types of relationships. So if you establish a relationship with Narayan, then uh, you see Narayan as supreme. And uh, you see yourself as very small. And you develop an attitude of reverence. And you see him as very powerful. And you act as a servant. So it's natural to be a servant. <laughs> and you can't project Sakya or Vatsalya upon that form. Uh, you cannot tie up Vishnu with a rope and punish him like that. It doesn't work. <laughs> you cannot come up and say, hi there, <laughs> and give him something. Uh, I got something for you. Like, you can't do that informally. Uh, you can't have Sakya, Vatsaya, or Madhurya. You're, you're forced because of that, the way in which Vishnu is presented. Uh, you know, he's in a position of power. He manifests powers. So Dasya is very natural, or even Shanta, neutral relationship. But uh, so if we want to get these higher relationships, uh, which probably most people would like to have, uh, Dasya is not such an aspired for relationship with most people, just to be a servant. They would like to have friendly relationship, parental relationship, or conjugal relationship. So you can't get that with God unless you go to Krishna. So you worship Krishna, then you can realize these types of relationships. So that's what put Krishna, put, uh, puts Krishna in the special relationship or special position, hmm? higher than the other forms of the Lord. Yeah. 
So therefore, by establishing a relationship with Krishna, we get the highest benefit for ourselves. We can get the higher type of bliss instead of being limited to Shanta or Dasya, then we can get these uh, relationships. The higher we go here, we've got it like this, it means that the experience is more intense in terms of rasa and bliss. So therefore, it's beneficial for the jiva to choose Krishna because then he could experience more bliss. <laughs> so by worshipping Krishna, then we get more bliss. And of course, we see here that uh, Madhurya Rasa has got the greatest bliss. <laughs> So that's why we say, okay, uh, we worship Radha Krishna for Madhurya Rasa because then you can get the highest bliss that way. Okay, so we can have various according to your choice. You're not forced to take one or the other. You could choose any of these relationships. Yeah. So it could be Sakya, could be Vatsalya, could be Madhurya Rasa. Could be Dasya also if you prefer Dasya. Okay. Or even Shanta Rasa. <laughs> yeah. So, establishing that relationship with the Lord is the cure for our attempt to get relationships. Yeah. When that is established, all the relationships of the world become meaningless or useless. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, because we got this uh, uh, great happiness and satisfaction from the relationship with Krishna. Oh, okay, fine. Hmm. When you say that all the relationships in the three world are false, they won't. When you say that, I thank you very much for the wonderful information sitting on the dinner. When you say that all the relationships in the three world are not real, I'll tell you they're real, but because we experience, the experience is a part of human life, a part of the jiva. Mm -hmm. Although it's a dream, maybe, I don't want to say the experience, it's real. The, the experience is real, but what we think it is, is not like that, it's something else, that's all. We project the nature of what yeah. we think is real, or yeah. also what yeah. we think the expectations, but the relationship with material nature, or even material people, it's real, okay. it's real. So it's not, it's temporary but real. It's real. You say, no, yeah. okay, you don't feel pain, you don't feel pain, somebody needs you for pain. Yeah. yeah. So I, I don't think it's correct to say it's not real. Yeah. So we feel pain, but actually the soul doesn't feel, in one sense, it can't get hurt. <laughs> you cannot cut the jiva, you cannot boil it, you cannot heat it, you cannot burn it, you cannot dry it up. You can't do anything with the soul with a material instrument. So in one sense, it's not hurt, but it feels like pain. Why? Because of ahankara. It identifies with the material body, and the material body has this reaction of pain because of nervous system, etc., etc. So in that sense, it's false. But nevertheless, the experience is real, and it goes to the jiva. So happiness and distress, in one sense, is false, yes, but the jiva experiences it, but it's experienced because of ahankara and identification with body. So no matter uh, what we do in the material world, we cannot escape the illusory nature because we're covered by ahankara, <laughs> and then we relate everything to the body, so then our, all of our experiences are, in that sense, false. But nevertheless, yes, we do have experiences. The, the, the matter cannot experience anything. Subtle body cannot really experience anything. Uh, the mind and the ego, they are only material elements, so it's only the jiva that can experience ultimately. But it's, it's a false experience. Are those relationships real or false? Well, the relationship, yeah. The relationships we have with the Supreme Lord and devotees on the spiritual level, those are real because it's relating the Atma to the Supreme Lord. But as far as we are doing sadhana, then we still have some covering of material energy, false ego, unless you get up to bhava and prema. So therefore, there is some interference there. So therefore, even though we're devotees, the marriages always don't work out. <laughs> yeah, I think there's problems in marriage and so many things because of the you know, uh, problems with the false ego and uh, all these different projections we may have. <laughs> well, we can tolerate very good. 
experience uh, whatever, material spiritual and you yeah. know hope yeah. and uh, whatever some wisdom is there so actually the um, as far as the material world is concerned uh, there's no perfect happiness because everybody's got a temporary body everybody disappears so it can't be perfect in that way so the ultimate we can do is uh, the perfect marriage or the perfect relationship as a, like a like compromise <laughs> some compromise huh? uh, and then uh, a bad relationship with where it's extremely you know incompatible whatever but uh, if we can uh, adapt and tolerate the situation then we can have a, a normal relationship it's, it's always a compromise in the material world nothing is perfect <laughs> So with regards to relationships, Maharaj, so we have the gross body and we have the subtle body, so um, similarly, do we have the gross material and subtle relationships? Like for example, we go to the supermarket and we want to get a um, kilo of bananas, a kilo of oranges, we just give the person some money, they bag it up and say thank you very much, and that's obviously gross you know, it's a bodily transaction, right? Or yeah. Food. But then on the other hand, if you're sort of, um, as they say, great minds think alike, that you think, oh, well, I'm going to cook this and invite my friends over and we're going to really enjoy fruit salad. So uh, that sort of uh, takes it onto the sort of subtle level. Yeah, that's uh, the emotional, so, emotional level. Uh, yeah, yeah, so um, like most of the interactions that um, can you say that most of the interactions that you have with people whom you tend to be your friends or whatever are really basically ones that are between subtle bodies on the subtle level rather than the gross level? Well, it's a combination. We have the subtle level, definitely, but then there's expectations on the gross level as well. That's why a person becomes attracted to another person. That's not subtle, that's gross. <laughs> that person is nice, that person is not nice, this is beautiful, this person is handsome. That's the gross material aspect. So there's both aspects there, the, the gross physical aspect and then there's the other higher aspect. Uh, so it's a combination of both. Uh, but if it's, if, it's, uh, if it's more prominently in the gross level, it's more likely to fail that relationship. <laughs> if we can get a combination with the, the subtle level, at least he can survive on the subtle level, then the, the gross level, even if there's problems, is not, not such a big deal. But if it's only on the gross level, then the, the relationship won't last for long because you always find a defect in the other person. <laughs> but then the emotional problem is, the emotional level's problem is because, of, because everybody's projecting something, expectation on the other person. In terms of physical and, and mental, the expectations are from the other person which the other, it may not be there in the other person, but we're expecting it. So that creates a problem also. <laughs> so the, the, the relationship, emotional aspect becomes very complex in human society and uh, human interactions because of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but even the temporary one gets mixed up, and we can't even get a, even a normal relationship out of that because of the, so many problems in our projections. You know? So that um, chart you had of the, um, the seven players. Mm. Uh, sort of uh, dealt with by like, true Christian consciousness. Sometimes you hear about the babies, later they join, they've got mental health problems and they're always having to deal with it to one degree or another or even they develop mental health problems while they lose. Mm -hmm. So how does that come about if we're presenting that it solves all your problems. It deals with all the issues. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, if um, they practice properly, then definitely the things will, all the problems disappear. So the, the main problem is, is probably not being prop <laughs> practiced properly, and therefore we get problems popping up. Yeah. So if, if that uh, unconditional love is expressed nicely, then automatically all the problems should dissipate. But if it's not, then we'll get problems. So. Uh, probably there is an external appearance of doing things, but then the internally they're not. <laughs> so that, that'll be, that's why the problem occurs, and, and they don't get relieved of their problems. I guess 
perhaps also it's a reaction with some apparatus? Could be, yeah. Apparatus could be there, not only from this lifetime, but maybe previous lifetimes, which cause them that they cannot even do bhakti properly. <laughs> they can try to do it, but then it doesn't work, you know, they can't, they can't express their, the, the Atma cannot express anything for the Lord positively. So, so well, we understand that the, um, the Jiva, mind, intelligence, false ego is situated in the region of the heart. Mm -hmm. But if you ask anybody, where is your mind, intelligence, everybody sees the head. Yeah. So how is it that we have the illusion that everything is situated in the head rather than the heart? <laughs> Uh, well, um, actually, the if you look in Sanskrit literature, they don't talk about the head at all. <laughs> the chitta, is the, there, the intelligence, they don't really talk about the head. Usually it's in the heart, everything is there. So maybe it's just a cultural phenomena, probably caused by uh, overemphasis on the left brain in intellectual development, <laughs> logical development, which is associated with this chakra also. So maybe that's the reason why. Yeah. Of course, uh, uh, the subtle body is everywhere in one sense, so even though the, we t maybe speak of the mind and emotions being here, the subtle body with the mind, intelligence, the ego is kind of spread out, it's the whole body as well, so it's not just here, but we can say a lot of it is centered here in the heart region, and because that, in the subtle body we have the heart chakra, so that's where emotional relationships are established huh? in the heart chakra. Yeah, I was thinking, I mean, we have the, uh, the eyes, the tongue, the ears, all the... And we have subtle ones the, also. The sensory, you know, senses are situated around the head, so... We tend to think in terms yeah, of that, yeah, because of that. A, yeah. yeah. You know, if you're thinking deeply or whatever, you get a headache, and mm. you know, <laughs> sort of everything, you know, happens around the head there, so I guess it's just a false identifying. spiritual relationship and that everything else is meaningless but when we're on the lower levels we're not that advanced to put that into practice so therefore we still have the material aspects of us so this leads to expectations in the material relationships including marriage so we can't really get rid of that at the very beginning stage later on of course we can and therefore we see even in the Varnashram system you go through the ashramas and you get grihastha life then you finish with that, then you renounce it. <laughs> At least you renounce your children, go off to take Vanaprastha. If you get more renounced, you renounce your wife also. Uh, but it's a, it's, that's according to age also and according to experience and family life that you later renounce it. So you're not expected to get, get that detachment or be qualified for that detachment when you're younger because you haven't developed physically or spiritually. 
So when we're practicing spiritual life, then yes, you may have, we understand that the world is meaningless and the relationships are all mine, etc. But we're not out of that, those relationships yet. <laughs> we're not completely detached. So therefore, the solution is go on with the relationships. So Lord Chaitanya says, whether you're a grihasta or a renounced person living in the forest, you perform bhakti and you chant the holy name in either case. Uh, so he's not expecting everyone to completely renounce immediately. It is more or less expected if you're going to be a yogi or a jnani, you have to do that in order to perfect the system. But in bhakti, no. So <laughs> it's like we can also use the senses. In jnana and yogi, you try to stop the senses. So in bhakti yoga, we can use the senses, use the mind, use family life, and still we can advance. Yeah. But of course, the, uh, we can say the rider on that is the condition is that we have to engage everything directed towards Krishna. So even we try to do the family life directed towards Krishna, and then we're safe. Um, so if the, um, the anarchical things and kind of following on with my mother's previous question, they're stopping us from establishing yeah. You know, say someone has some severe mental yeah. um, issues. What's the, is it just, they just have to kind of wait until they get some mercy? Well, they, can, they, they keep practicing and trying to, not just the externals, but internally, they have to keep trying to establish that affectionate relationship with Krishna, that's all. So in other words, the unconditional love is stronger than everything else to adjust everything. So they can... Um, work internally and try to develop that unconditional love, then that will help to solve all the problems. But I would suspect that probably they're not doing that, doing the external, but they're doing the internal, so that's why it's not working. But it may be very difficult also for them to do that internal thing because they're so affected, you know, psychologically, whatever, it's very difficult for them to express unconditional love. But that's actually what's necessary. Psychologically, you mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, then, and then they've opened the door to... Well, I suppose you could do both. So it's like we can say that, okay, uh, surrender to the Lord, all your health problems are solved, but then we also go to the doctor, <laughs> go to the dentist and whatever like that, just to get immediate you know, solution to some things like that. So it's not that we have to reject anything on the lower level, we can also use that. Well, um, of course, on the lower level, we can say um, all rasas in the material world which are relationships are of a perverted reflection of the spiritual relationships. So when we relate in the material world, we're actually trying to express that relationship with Krishna, but we don't, we're not accepting Krishna, so we're trying to produce, reproduce that relationship in the material world. That's all. Uh, so it, it's not going to work out, obviously. Um, that's on the lowest level. Of course, if we become a devotee, we don't have to give up relationships, we don't in most cases, so we at least we have a perspective that they're trying to make them in relation to Krishna somehow, that's all, make them a little more favorable. So as I said, for family life, then you could raise a family in Krishna consciousness, for instance, something like that. Yeah, I suppose the problems that are in relationships is when you expect something out of that person in return, and that's when the balance is coming about. Yeah. But in 
you get disappointed in the relationship because they're not responding like you expect them to respond. Yeah. <laughs> but you told like we're already because we're part and parcel with Krishna, we're already perfect because everything that comes from Krishna must be perfect because how can anything imperfect come from a perfect person? Uh, well, we can say that, um, yeah, all these experiences are there to make us learn something and ultimately to make us learn that everything in the material world is faulty, <laughs> that we should get out of the material world and go to Krishna. <laughs> in that sense, it's perfect because it's an education for us. Yeah, yeah. And just a, a different uh, uh, note. Um, I, a devotee mentioned that like, all relations are built on Dasya. So we, we talk about Dasya like it's um, um, like an angel or or whatever. So we're striving for higher, like, easy friendship and parental. They're all Dasya in one with Krishna. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We say the Nitya Krishna Das, everybody's the eternal servant of Krishna. So our mm, innate position is a little particle in relation to God who is everything. So that, that, that's there. Yeah? Uh, but um, when God manifests his power, Aishvarya, then that Dasya becomes very strong and emphasize because we are small and he's very powerful so he manifests all those powers and that dasya is an automatic you say the natural mode for us with krishna because he, we, he emphasizes the sweetness not the power then that aishvarya decreases as as the madhurya increases the sweetness increases the power aspect decreases and so with krishna then the power aspect disappears and the maduria or sweetness increases and therefore the intimacy of the relationship becomes a factor so therefore we'll get sakya and dasya vatsalya and uh, the dasya becomes it's also there with krishna but in a different way afterwards it's a more intimate type of dasya there yeah? and then the other relationships develop as equal or superior even yeah? be based on intimacy and uh, sweetness and going back to the last one, so is Yeah. Uh, yeah. If we don't expect anything, then uh, we're not disturbed by any situation in the world. <laughs> That's uh, we call tolerance. And we tolerate everything in this material world, yeah. and we also forgive everything, even if they do things to us. We forgive it also. We don't. We're not too attached to it. Yeah. And of course, we can also say that uh, in uh, the Shishastika Amani Namana Dena. Uh, you know, we give respect to all and we don't expect respect for ourselves and we're humbled in a blade of grass and we're tolerant as a tree. So that's there in that particular verse we get the mm, attitude of the devote, ideal attitude of the devotee in the material world. He just tolerates the situation here and goes on with this bhakti. <laughs> okay. Hare Krishna.